In part one of lecture nine, we answer the question, what is virtual memory? Virtual memory systems usually involve using an image of memory that is larger than the physical memory of the computer. The first computer to use the concept was the Atlas system built at the University of Manchester in England and it was popularized in the United States by its use in the IBM 360 family of computers. We spoke earlier about swapping, moving the core images of programs in and out of disk storage when we switched active processes. Virtual memory usually assumes that there is more than one process resident in logical memory and that parts of these processes are resident in physical memory and that we can use part of our disk storage as an extension of physical memory. Why do we do this? Because disk storage has always been less expensive than main memory and this allows us to extend our memory capacity by a large extent. As we will see shortly, there is a compromise, namely that our performance will suffer and we will try to minimize the impact. Virtual memory works for us because we don't need to keep the whole program in memory. And it won't necessarily degrade performance by that large a margin most of the time. Let's take a look at a few examples. There are many routines in a program that do not get used that often. One example might be an error handling routine. While every program must have them, we do not really expect that most programs will call a particular error handling routine that frequently. By frequently, we mean that it may not involve more than 1% or 2% of our execution time. This is not very much compared to other routines, which may handle, for example, keyboard input. Arrays and other data structures usually have a large amount of storage allocated for them. Most programmers, myself included, try to make sure that we can handle as large an array as we are ever likely to see. But we may not need all the space that we allocate. And we may only need these data structures when running certain procedures. The rest of the time, we don't need them. Additionally, some programs include features that are rarely used. I use the spell checker of my word processor frequently, given that I can type 30 or 40 mistakes a minute. But I almost never use my thesaurus. That means I do not typically need it to be resident in physical memory. And for this reason, my computer reads it in from disk when I do, in fact, need it. Virtual memory provides many benefits. It means that our programs can be much larger than the limits of physical memory. This means that computers can run programs that would be beyond their abilities were it not for virtual memory. Virtual memory allows the same computer to have multiple processes resident in memory. The system can now switch between processes without having to swap out one process and swap in another. All it needs is to keep in memory the portions that are in use at that particular moment. That cuts down the cost of switching processes by a significant amount. The most common form of virtual memory system is demand paging. That's what you will see on the next few slides. There are two processes in physical memory, one shown in light blue, the other in dark blue. 
The green frames belong to a third process whose pages are not shown on Backing Store. Let's take a brief look at how virtual memory works. An instruction includes a reference to a memory location. The address includes a reference to a particular page of virtual memory. The page is looked up in the memory map and it turns out that this page is in frame so-and-so. That means we can look up the memory reference without a problem. If the page is not in memory, the memory map will indicate that. That means that we will have to look for it in backing store. In some cases, there will be available frames of memory into which we can load the page. This will not always be the case. That means that we have to swap one page out of memory, writing its contents on backing store. In some cases, this may not be necessary. If we did not change anything in this page of memory, the version on backing store may still be an accurate reflection of its contents. If not, this step is crucial to maintaining the integrity of the process. How we choose this page is something that we will discuss at length in a little while. Now that the contents of that page is safe, we can read in the contents of the page that we need. The situation is called a page fault, and we have just seen how we handle it in summary form.